Carolyn Conley here to take you through the week on HRTV. This week, Pursuit of the Cup journeyed back to the 17th running of the Breeders' Cup to remember War Chant, the mile champion. Into the final furlong now. Northeast bound, Dick's down deep, and he's tenaciously holding on to the lead. A firm success is what is going on. Here comes the top here, and the giant strides. War Chant is flying as they come to the finish. Here's the winner. War Chant, War Chant coming from 13th in this field. When he got here, he was really a young horse. He's a late Mayfoal, which means when he ran in the Derby, he wasn't even really three. So he was very immature. The guys always say that they know now what their mother went through when they were 16, because he is the ultimate bad boy. I mean, he just likes to do everything the hard way. Kind of reminds me of Fonzie, you know? He's a great horse, great guy, but can be tough when he needs to be. They've been exercising horses here for a long time. We started when Seattle Slough came, and it really is not only for their physical benefit, but for their mental benefit. It's somebody else telling them what to do, somebody else getting them out in the morning. You know, it's what they're born to do. They love to do it. He has a great time. He's the first horse that goes out every morning. He's just a real professional every morning, but he loves to go. War Chant! War Chant coming from 13th in this field! Describing War Chant, you rode him to victory in 2000. They talked about how aggressive he was, kind of a bad boy. I can see why you guys fit so well together. Yeah, Neil Drysdale came to me. I was actually retired at the time. I hadn't come out of retirement in 2000. He said, I've got a horse for you. We're going to win the Breeders' Cup Mile with. He said, but you've got to ride him. I started working him about a month before I made my return. I rode him in a prep race. We won that, and I was in the winter circle in the Breeders' Cup in one month. So Neil hit it right on the head, and the, the farm manager hit it right on the head there, too. He, he was a bad boy, but a good boy. He could fly home. Well, when you get those phone calls, you certainly got to pick up your head. Gary Stevens, 2000 Breeders' Cup mile win with War Chant Lafitte. Gary, do you think that you got there in time? Yeah, I did when he kicked in the gear. When I swung him out coming into the stretch and hit the, the mound out in the middle of the track where the fastest going was, there was no question in my mind I was going to get there. It was just uh, I didn't want to run out over the top of the horses in front of me. From a memorable miler to a very memorable three-year-old, Ron Turcott was on the phone to share stories of the 1973 Triple Crown winner, Secretariat. Now and then the stretch, it's sec Secretariat. Secretariat on the outside to take the lead. Sham holding in second. It's Secretariat moving away, he has it by two and a half. Sham, then on the outside, our native. At the wire, it's going to be Secretariat. He wins it by two lengths. When you go to sleep at night, do you still ever reflect back on what it was like to sit aboard Big Red? You know, it's something I could never, uh, everybody asked me, you know, how did it feel uh, win the Triple Crown after 25 years, and how does it feel to win by 31 lands and stuff like that, and something that after all these years I've never been able to explain, you know, my feeling. Was it just unfair for the rest of the riders out there when you were on this horse on the racetrack? Oh, I guess you could say that. When he was right, yes, he was incredible. Was it tough to say goodbye to him when they, when they retired Secretariat? Yes, you know, there's some of, uh, you know, they were, you know, like family to us, you know, Secretariat and River Ridge. Uh, they were, you know, we spend uh, a couple of years with them and, you know, you get so accustomed to them. But you try not to fall in love with horses because you know you're going to lose them sooner or later. If you don't get taken off, you'll, you're going to retire anyway. Last week at the Meadows, we saw the elimination round. This week, we saw Vintage Masters say adios to the competition. Down the stretch they come, Ideal Danny coming to the wire. If I can dream, slight urging from Brennan. If I can dream, well said, keep it real. School kids, well said, keep it real. They're just jiggy jogging, well said. Vintage Master in the Lightning Lane, coming to the wire, Mr. Wiggles, Vintage Master. And the battle's on, well said, Mr. Wiggles on the outside, noses apart, stride for stride, Mr. Wiggles, Vintage Master, Vintage Master, and Dan Dubay, 149 and 2. Vintage
Vintage Master with Daniel Dubay in the bike. Vintage Master had finished second and nose behind Mr. Wiggles in the eliminations. Vintage Master had finished second also behind Well Said in the Meadowlands pace. Huge upset at 13 to 1 as Well Said at 2 to 5. Unable to get the victory there in that Adios Finals. So uh, Well Said, not his day to day. Michael Stout's impressive 1-2-3 finish in Ascot's King George was highlighted by Conduit, winner of last year's Breeders' Cup turf. International reporter Fanny Salmon was on site for all the action. Run on the mile and a half of the Velvet Turf Course of Ascot, the King George is the summer jewel of the English Classic program. A race that Sir Michael Stout knows very well, having won it with Shergar, Opera House and Golan. A contest he targeted with Conduit, British Cup Turf Champion 2008. Well, he won it there last year, so obviously, you know, we've, it's on his agenda, but we, won't, we don't have anything set in stone. And the fact that uh, Conduit is eligible to participate in the Breeders' Cup again is a huge thrill and assuming that everything goes according to plan and the trainer thinks that this is what he should do. That's a Michael Stout dream! The three of them fighting out the King George in front Conduit are battling back with Tartan Bearer but it's Conduit who's extending all the way to the line. Ryan Moore has chosen right. What a day for Sir Michael Stout! In the final furlongs, Conduit leaned on stable mate Tartan Bear, prompting an inquiry. After hearing both jockeys, the stewards left the placings unchanged. One, two, three, well, you, could, you couldn't have dreamt of it, really. And I was more pleased that these three high-class coats have, that have just run up to just about their best, you know. I didn't think they would reverse the placings. I think the best horse today won. But he did interfere with the second, but from my point of view, it was consoling that there was the same ownership, not just the same trainer, it was also the same ownership. I think he brought us luck today. When HRTV Rewind returns, we're heading to the spa. Average cost of a manicure, Siegel, I know you don't know this. I don't know. No, I meant Saratoga. Has the party already started out there at Saratoga? What's going on behind <laughs> you? You know, you guys made a mistake of calling me right so I was passing these jazz musicians. And John Avello helps Aaron and Jeff pick a winner. If it's firm, if it's yielding, if it's good, I don't think it matters. She runs on everything. And forever together, coming with giant strides, and there she is to win the Diana again. Forever together. Bullet drill here, and you've done some great work. And now spa opening weekend, we're going to do a little spa trivia, but not that Saratoga Racecourse spa. Average cost of a manicure, Siegel. I know you don't know this. I don't know. I don't know. 30 bucks. I don't hey, know. You know what? That's about right. That's really close. Most popular <laughs> polish color when getting a manicure. Uh, red? Yeah, that's close to French manicure, actually. Gloss. Oh, white that's tip. not a color. Then. Now, okay. this is the really big question. Okay. Mud bath. Is it really mud? I'm going to call it sloppy, then mud, drying out to good, and then fast. Wow, upgrading it. It's actually <laughs> red clay, sir. Oh, okay. Trainer Tom Amos joined Race Day America this week for a little back talk before Saratoga's Sanford Stakes. How has he changed mentally and physically from one race to the next? Well, um, that's a good question. Uh, and I would say that, that uh, what I liked about his last race was that his trip was not clean. He stumbled a little bit at the start, fell behind horses, and around the turn with more than half the race still to go. He really didn't look like he was a horse that was, was into it, a horse that was going to win. So the fact that he battled, battled and, uh, and won that race, I think, plays uh, big for, for him. Has the party already started out there at Saratoga? What's going on behind you? <laughs> you know, you guys made the mistake of calling me right as so I was passing these jazz musicians. So you're probably hearing that, but I can tell you, you all know every day's a party here. <laughs> Tom, how much fun is it to be racing at Saratoga? You know, Saratoga is, is, is one of those unique places like Del Mar, like Keeneland, in that, you know, the whole place and the whole town that surrounds those tracks is all about racing. So it's, for a trainer, it's one of those rare moments to be the center of attention and for his horse to be the center of attention. And that's always very exciting. You know, we don't get a lot of that anymore. So, uh, so I, I, I definitely enjoy that. Back talk down the center of the racetrack. Nacho Friend is looking for a way through. Bulls and Bears has run a remarkable race to get in contention late. They are in the final furlong now, and here comes Enumerate. Enumerate between horses. Louisville Luminary is there. Back talk on the outside. Bulls and Bears and down toward the rail. Nacho Friend 
A wild finish in the Sanford that goes to Backtalk. In case you missed it, here's a look back at opening week in Saratoga Springs. And it is hot Dixie Chick. And she wins the Scottsdale by a half a dozen lengths. Back talk down the center of the racetrack. A wild finish in the Sanford that goes to back talk. And it is Be Fair, who has taken the lead away from Mary's Follies and will go on to win Lake George. And forever together, coming with giant strides. And there she is to win to Diana again. Forever together. The first repeat winner in two decades. Kensei now with a two and a half length lead. And Kensei takes the Jim Dandy by two. Kensei, Jess Jackson's just getting warmed up. Just enough humor, a rising star here to win the four star day by almost three. Seven straight fighting hard all the way, Missy Zella third. Sprightly narrowly, seven straight fights on to the lead. It's seven straight in front coming down to the wire. A special guest from Las Vegas helped Aaron and Jeff pick a winner this week in the Diana Stakes. The Diana Stakes is a grade one. It's a $500,000 race. It is on Saturday. Goes as race number nine, and we're pleased now to be joined by John Avello, who's the director of the Race and Sports Book at the Wynn Casino in Las Vegas. John, thanks again for joining us on Against the Odds. Oh, you're welcome, guys. We're looking at the Diana field, and I know you've delved into this already. John, who do you like? Well, you know, when I, when I look at the 10 horse forever together, um, boy, he looks awful tough against this particular field. He, uh, you know, he, he, this, is only, this will be his third race back and, uh, after the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Turf race that he won, and, and she, uh, race that she won. And, uh, you know, then a, a race at Keeneland on, a, on an uh, off track and a race at Belmont on an off track. Both were decent races. I just think she's geared up and ready to run. But forecast shows for the next week possibly rain. Uh, I know they had a nice day today, but it's volatile up there. I know it from being from the area, so you never know what you're going to find from day to day. Uh, so, if the, but in, in Forever Together's case, it won't matter. It won't matter if it's if it's firm, if it's yielding, if it's good. I don't think it matters. She runs on everything. And there she is to win the Diana again. Forever Together. Trainer Jonathan Shepard stopped by Race Day America on Sunday after winning a second Diana Stakes with Forever Together. Jonathan, you told Karen Johnson of the Saratoga Special that the, that uh, Forever Together could be better this year, that you two have gotten to know each other better. What have you learned about her at this stage, and what has she learned about you? Um, <laughs> she, what I've learned about her is that Ellie opinionated. <laughs> uh, she needs to be handled uh, a little bit firmly but gently. She likes to kind of take her time. She likes to think that she's that it's sort of her idea to do something rather than you're kind of forcing her to do it before she's ready. Um, basically, just trying to keep her happy, keep her sweet. She still gets a pint of Guinness in her feet every night. <laughs> I think helps. I think we've just sort of grown to respect and have confidence in each other a little bit, you know, like other relationships, really. Sunday was the first running of the Curlin Stakes at the track where he won the Grade One Woodward and the current home of his favorite lead pony, Poncho. And here comes Straightness Sesto into the bridge and on through to the lead and Curlin's to his outside. Straight Sesto in front at the eight pole. Curlin giving his all. Coming out to the bridge, Straight Sesto. Here comes Curlin. Curlin surging. Straight Sesto in deep water. Now across the goal. Curlin across the goal. And Curlin has powerhousing up. Street Sense did not go on, and it's all Curlin in the race of the year for Horse of the Year. It's Curlin in an absolutely stylish performance. Robbie Alvarado and Curlin to go. Curlin lead close to the winning post, and from the red, white, and blue corner by TKO is Curlin. The daunting presence of Curlin. It is Curlin now in front. Curlin beyond cigar. He is America's richest racehorse. Blame Guam Typhoon and gone astray. It's now blame and gone astray. Guam Typhoon will be third. And blame the winner three quarters of a length. 
gutty effort from Blame and Jamie Terrio threading the needle to outduel Gone Astray to the Wire in the Curling Stakes. When HRTV Rewind returns, we're going all the way back to 1988. Great race. I thought she was hopeless to beat the 3 8 ball, which shows what a good filly she is to be able to overcome it and win. And the Preakness winner versus the Belmont winner. She's six lengths out in front. Here's a filly for the ages, a Haskell legend, Rachel Welcome back to HRTV Rewind, taking you all the way back to 1988. In the 1988 Breeders' Cup at Churchill Downs, D. Wayne Lucas became the first trainer to win three Breeders' Cup races in one day. Lucas won the sprint with Gulch, the juvenile fillies with Open Mind, and the juvenile with 9 to 1, Is It True, who upset heavy favorite Easy Goer on a muddy track. Is it true? Try to hold on. Easy Goer can't get to it. Meanwhile, Ali Sheba concluded his 1988 Horse of the Year campaign by winning the Classic. And they're off. Ali Sheba's Classic Triumph perhaps is best remembered for being run in near darkness. And the 1988 Breeders' Cup Distaff produced one of the greatest moments in the history of thoroughbred racing. At the top of the stretch, Personal Ensign was struggling in the mud. With winning colors running strongly, it appeared that Personal Ensign was headed for her first loss. Personal Ensign, five lengths off the lead of winning colors. But displaying the heart of a champion, Personal Ensign rallied inexorably to win by the narrowest of margins in a performance for the ages. I thought she was hopeless to beat the 3 8 ball, which shows what a good filly she is to be able to overcome it and win. Thanks to her dramatic victory in the distaff, Personal Ensign retired with a perfect record, 13 victories from 13 starts. I wonder if that's the day that the concept for the <laughs> Downs After Dark program was born. They could have used the lights on that Breeders' Cup Saturday. Yeah, it was dark, but we saw it well on television. I don't think the people at the racetrack could see very well, though. This week, the 2009 Kentucky Derby, Preakness, and Belmont winners were all back in action in Mountaineers' West Virginia Derby and Monmouth's Haskell Invitational. Might that bird now was coming on to take the lead as they come down to the finish and a spectacular, spectacular upset. Mind that bird has won the Kentucky Derby. An impossible result here from the back of the pack. Mind that bird, 13th, 12th, 11th. And he's tense now. Rachel Alexandra, the leader of the field, turns for home. Mind that bird looks for a way through, and he had to go way outside for it. Mind that bird is third on the outside. The Philly trying to hold on. She's clear by three. Mind that bird runs at her leg, and the Philly did it. Rachel Alexandra has defeated the Kentucky Derby winner. Here comes Mind that bird with a bold blitz toward the lead. He's catapulting by horses. Summer Bird is going to take a late run at him. Dunkirk is not done yet. Dunkirk comes right back. Mind that bird. And here is Summer Bird. And here is Summer Bird to win the Belmont Stakes. Big Drama in front by two. Mind that bird on the outside of Soul Warrior. Big Drama at the 16th pole. Soul Warrior in the centre is coming out after him. Big Drama. Soul Warrior. Soul Warrior gets up to win the derby by a head. In a shocker, Jeff. Soul Warrior over the derby winner and the favourite, Big Drama. And in this case, you see Big Drama really getting tired. Mind that bird not really punching it in and allows the horse who was second in the Iowa Derby in his last start to upset them both. Soul Warrior in a shocker. Right when they were going into the turn, Dale Beckner, who was replacing Miguel Mena, uh, we don't know what happened there. Anyway, he moved with him right at the same time on the inside, and yeah, Big Drama just hit a wall the by, last By the way, yards. Gary, 41 seconds, if the clock is correct, for the last three eighths of a mile. They were just stopping. Wow. Well, not the winner, because the winner was still sit about eight lengths behind him at the three. Okay. <laughs> so he was going a 40 little, seconds. He was going a little less slow well, then. Yeah. <laughs> a little less slow. Prickness and Belmont winners Rachel Alexandra and Summer Bird challenged each other in the Haskell Invitational Sunday at Monmouth Park. Been starting off the second Breeders' Cup 411 of the year. Jess Jackson talks about the fact that 
Rachel Alexandra's only got one more Triple Crown winner to defeat, and that will be attempted in the Haskell against Summer Bird. The way they have promoted this tri uh, uh, race for us and raising the purse was a factor. Uh, we're not looking for an easy race for her. We're trying to prove how good she is. And uh, taking on another champion we haven't run against is, it was attractive as well. All of those horses ha have the potential uh, to, uh, to show up on any given Saturday, and so the race is uh, well contested. She's a filly, and uh, running against the boys uh, would not be uh, an embarrassment if there was a loss. You know, this colt has shown a lot of ability early. Um, now, how much progress he made in such a short time. It, it was impressive for him. The Colts had seven weeks now between the Belmont to the Haskell. Uh, he had five weeks between the Kentucky Derby to the Belmont. So the time in between does him good. He's really grown up. Uh, he's matured a lot, filled out very nicely. So Of course, uh, Rachel Alexandra. Do you think you can beat her? I have a very nice Colt, and I will give her a run for the money. And we're looking forward to the race. And Rachel Alexandra has taken the lead. Three quarters in 109 and four. And she turns for home with a four length lead. Munnings is second. Summer Bird, Papa Clum. But it's Rachel Alexandra by the 16th pole. She's six lengths out in front. Here's a filly for the ages. A Haskell legend. Rachel Alexandra did it. As a two year old. And as a three-year-old, I don't think there's been a filly as good since Ruffy, and maybe she's better than Ruffy. I don't know if we're going to ever let her really run. <laughs> uh, she's running to beat the, the competition in, in Hanley. Uh, I don't know whether she'll ever get to a secretary at record or not, and what her true distance is. We haven't found the depth of her yet. What's, but we really appreciate all the fan support. Well, what's your goal for her for the rest of the year, Jess? Uh, We'll let her tell us. All right. She's extremely fast. She's very special. She's uh, been able to separate herself from everybody else. Sir, I don't know how good she is. When a horse is going to come up to her and eye to eye, then I'm going to tell you how good she is. That's all for HRTV this week. Here's what you can look forward to next week, including an all new episode of Inside Information. Bertrando had already proven himself on the track as a two-year-old and three-year-old under Bruce Headley's tutelage. The son of Skywalker, Bertrando and Alex Solis win the Del Mar for two. I think everyone who was involved with the horse, you know, felt that that was the natural progression to get him to the Derby. And he certainly performed that way along that trail. Bertrando takes down deep, finds more, and Bertrando is... A fever knocked Bertrando off the Derby trail. But the next year, he was on top of his game again. He was a true speed horse, so he was just kind of one of those horses was like, come and get me. You know, he'd break out of the gate, go to the lead, and, and you'd have to catch him. As a four-year-old, Bobby Frankel conditioned him to take on the top horses of his generation. Bertrando kicks through in the white cap. He was the type of horse who knew how good he was. He carried himself with a, a certain kind of confidence or uh, aura about him. And for a million dollars, in the Pacific Classic, I, I knew crossing under the finish line the first time, I basically had a smile on my face. 